I'm Travis Simone, lead pastor at the Williamsburg Community Chapel. And today we will continue to fix our eyes on Jesus in everyday life. We'll be looking at a passage of Jesus' teaching about marriage. And a quick heads up before you get to the sermon portion of this worship service. Marriage can obviously have some adult themes around it. As I put the sermon together, I was aware that in this current public health situation, families might be worshiping together. I would be comfortable with my eight-year-old or my six-year-old viewing the entire worship service. But I did want to mention the topic and the potential adult themes around it. I believe that I've covered it in a way that is for everybody, but just take that into consideration when you get to that portion of the worship service. In our passage, Jesus talks about hardness of heart that can creep in around a topic as personal as marriage. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for this worship service, that Jesus might soften our hearts, fix our eyes on him, and our ears be attentive to his word. Let's prepare our hearts now. great morning to worship. Let's lift our voices together. Come, Christians, join to sing. friend to us he'll condescend his love shall never end alleluia amen would we ask that this morning he send out his light and his truth as we worship and seek him together pray these words with me from psalm 43 heavenly father send out your light and your truth let them lead me let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling then i will go to the altar of god to God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Amen. Welcome to worship at the Williamsburg Community Chapel on this first Sunday of February. We're so grateful that we can meet you wherever you are, spiritually and physically, and worship together with you. I would like to invite you this evening to join us for another worship opportunity, and it is our monthly service of communion, which will be happening at five o'clock, and we will host that inside, outside, and online. So if you would like to join us here at the chapel, wonderful, or if you would like to join us from your home, we invite you to celebrate and remember the death of Jesus Christ for our sins on the cross. If you don't have any elements that you can use in your home to celebrate communion, you can come by the chapel between 12 and 1 this afternoon and pick those up, and we'll have those provided for you. 
As we turn to prayer in our worship service, I'm reminded of words that I've recently been studying from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. This is the very end of the Apostle Paul's very first recorded sermon in the New Testament, and he encourages his readers and his listeners and us with some powerful words about Jesus Christ the Savior. Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39 read, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. I will lead us now in a time of prayer, following which I invite you to join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Indeed, Father, we are grateful for this man, Jesus Christ, who has freed us, who has given us absolute freedom and salvation through his sacrifice, through his resurrection. And we are grateful that we eagerly look forward to the day when he returns again. Thank you so much for that incredible salvation that you have provided through your son. Thank you for the peace that that can give us. Peace, especially in unsettling times, knowing that we are forgiven and freed through faith in Christ. Even now, as we move into this time of worship, Lord, may you minister to us wherever we are, whatever struggles, whatever anxieties, whatever joys we may be experiencing. We pray that you will be glorified and we will worship you in spirit and in truth. And now, Lord, together, we pray the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. mine 
bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Well, as we consider God who gave us everything in Christ, we take a moment now to give back to him. Please visit wcchapel.org slash giving as we give unto the Lord his tithes and our offerings. Today's scripture reading will be found in Matthew chapter 19 verses 1 through 9, and you can follow along in your own Bibles or on the ESV app. Matthew chapter 19 verses 1 through 9. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them men and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall, became, shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My favorite sport is baseball. And I get tired of people talking about how boring baseball is and how football's the new national pastime. So on this Super Bowl Sunday, I'm going to start with a baseball illustration. I once got the opportunity to hear Cal Ripken speak. Cal's nickname is the Iron Man because he played 2,632 consecutive baseball games without ever taking a day off. And he'd just written a book entitled Get in the Game, The Eight Elements of Perseverance That Make the Difference. And there I was listening to Cal talk about the eight elements of perseverance that make a difference when my dad, who was attending with me, nudged me. He said, I have a feeling that Cal's going to take questions at the end of this. I think if you're the first one to stand up, he'll call on you and you can talk to the Iron Man. I was so focused on timing it right that I, I really wasn't thinking about a, a question. And as Cal, Cal's talk came to an end, I, he said, I'm going to. And I popped up. He said, take questions. And he said, you right there in the third row. And I realized that now I had to come up with something. And so I just said, Cal, you are the Iron Man. You are the one that knows so much about perseverance. I just, I just need you to tell me the one secret to it all. If you could give me one piece of advice, what would it be? Cal said, that's a dumb question. I just spent 90 minutes telling you the eight elements of perseverance that make a difference. I sat down in my chair a bit humiliated. The Iron Man took me to school to remind me what he had literally just said. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus takes the Pharisees to school to remind them what God has said about the weighty topics of marriage and divorce. 
If we look at Matthew 19 closely, we will, we will hear Jesus teach us God's starting point for marriage, God's design for marriage, and that God understands the pain of unfaithfulness in marriage. God's starting point for marriage is this. We see the Pharisees ask Jesus the question in Matthew 19, verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? It's a difficult question that the Pharisees ask Jesus. And it's wrapped up in a, a lot of discussion in Jesus' day between two competing rabbinic schools about how to interpret a difficult set of words in a difficult passage in Deuteronomy chapter 21, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. It's a very difficult question. And the Pharisees say, How do you view it, Jesus? And look at how Jesus starts his answer in verse 4. He answered, have you not read? Have you not read? Jesus says, I am going to answer this question according to what the Bible says. Have you not read? What's my view? My view is the Bible's view. I find this fascinating. That when God took on flesh in Jesus Christ and people asked him about marriage, his starting point was the Bible. Have you not read? And my question is, if the Bible was Jesus Christ's starting point, God incarnate's starting point, is the Bible your starting point for marriage? Or is your opinion your starting point for marriage? Is, are your emotions your starting point when it, when it comes to your thinking about marriage? Are your needs your starting point when it comes to your thinking about marriage? Is our culture's message about marriage your starting point when it comes to your thinking about marriage? God's starting point for marriage is the Bible, is that your starting point for your thinking on marriage as well? And so then we come to what Jesus' answer is. This is God's design for marriage. It's in verses 4 through 6 of Matthew 19. He answered, Have you not read, starting point is the Bible, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. To help us understand God's design for marriage, Jesus quotes two passages from the book of Genesis, Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. And then he states the clear implication of these passages when they are understood together. Let me summarize what Jesus has said. God's design for marriage is one man, one woman, one flesh for your one life. God's design for marriage is oneness. When Nina and I celebrated our 10th anniversary, we were headed to New York City because that's where we got engaged. So we thought, why not celebrate the 10th anniversary of our marriage in the place where we committed to uh, getting married together? And on our way out of town, we stopped at a fast food place for breakfast, and Nina went in to order, and I said, I'll, I'll have my usual, and you know I love to drink iced tea for breakfast. I'm not a coffee guy. If I'm going out for breakfast, I'm getting iced tea. And Nina went in and she came back and she had my favorite meal and I started eating it. And then I went to take a, I went to take the iced tea out of the cup holder and I took a sip and it was lukewarm. And I said, Nina, how come there's no ice in the iced tea? Whenever I order my iced tea, I always say I'll take a large unsweet tea with lots of ice. She said, 
you know, Trav, I just knew you had something weird with the ice. That didn't feel like oneness to me. Lots of ice. No ice. Ice is in the name of the drink. It's called iced tea. And yet, the oneness of my opinion about how I take my favorite breakfast beverage was somehow elusive between me and my bride. You see, God's design for oneness, God's design for marriage is oneness, but that does not mean that achieving oneness between a man and a woman is easy. And so I want to challenge us this, this worship service to do the hard work that oneness requires. Are you willing to do the hard work of oneness? What is the hard work that oneness requires? Well, it, it comes to us in that passage from Genesis chapter 2 that Jesus is quoting here in Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to go back to Genesis because there's a verse, verse 25 following verse 24, I believe is also very instructive. The hard work of oneness. Let me read it to you from Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The hard work of oneness is this. Leave, cleave, and uncover. Leave. Jesus says, the marital relationship is even more important than the man's relationship with his parents. A lot of people would see the, the man's relationship with his parents as, as of utmost importance. And God says, no, that's not the most important relationship. The man's going to have to leave that relationship to enter into this new relationship with his wife. I'm grateful for a lot of things from my parents that my parents taught me, a lot of the sacrifices the parents made for me. I, I, I'm sure you are grateful for many things from your parents as well. But the truth is, we also picked up some bad habits from our parents. We also may have picked up some hurt from our parents. We also may have picked up some things that we've had to forgive our parents for. And it's difficult for us to go back and, and to think about those aspects of our relationship with our parents. And Jesus says, you are going to have to leave those bad habits. You're going to have to leave that hurt. You're going to have to leave that hurt. You're going to have to leave behind some of the things that were so difficult for you. Otherwise, you're constantly going to be fighting old battles in this new relationship with your husband or your wife. What from your childhood, what hurts and wounds from your parents do you need to leave behind to pursue oneness with your spouse? After you leave your father and mother, you've got to cleave to your wife. Cleave is the translation from the King James that we read here in the ESV, hold fast. But I love that word cleave because it gets at the word picture that the author of Genesis wants us to see of two pieces of metal that have been forged and forged and soldered together. Two things that it seems impossible to get together through pressure and heat have come together. We have to cleave to our spouse, cling to them, hold fast to them, commit to them, get close to them might be a good modern day translation. What do you need to do to cling, to be forged together, to experience closeness with your spouse? And finally, uncover. Genesis says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Naked, uncovered. I believe this shows that when shame is low in a relationship, the potential for oneness is high. 
But when our shame gets higher and higher in a relationship, our potential for oneness gets lower and lower. So we must remain uncovered in our marital relationship. Maybe you've started covering some things up. Maybe you've started hiding some things from your spouse. Maybe you're ashamed of some things and you're not discussing them openly in an uncovered fashion with your spouse. Let me just tell you this. When shame is high, oneness is low. Take some time in the next week or month and make a plan to uncover those things. Be honest with your spouse and you will do the hard work of oneness in your marriage relationship. When you leave, when you cleave, when you uncover. If you are not willing to do the hard work of oneness in your marriage, I want to ask yourself, what has become hard in my heart? You see, when the Pharisees hear Jesus' uh, description of God's design of marriage as oneness, they say, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of divorce? And the truth is Moses didn't command it. It was an allowance. It was a concession, Jesus says, due to the hardness of mankind's heart. If you're not willing to do the, the hard work of oneness, ask, where is my heart hard? And ask God to soften it and do the hard work of oneness. God's design for marriage is oneness. Are you willing to do the hard work? Of oneness. Lastly, God understands the pain of unfaithfulness in marriage. This may be a very painful sermon for some. Painful because you were unwilling to do the hard work of oneness in your marriage and your marriage ended in divorce. Painful because of the hardness of your heart led to a marriage that ended, ended in divorce. Or it could be a painful sermon because someone you trusted and were married to was not willing to do the hard work of oneness in your marriage and through no fault of your own, that marriage ended in divorce. Or something that had been covered for a long time got uncovered in your marriage and that ruptured the oneness of your marriage to the point where it ended in divorce. I want you to hear me very clearly. God understands the pain of unfaithfulness in marriage. After Jesus teaches the Pharisees God's starting point for marriage and God's design for marriage and points out the hardness of their hearts that made them so quick to twist Moses' allowance for divorce into a command to be used for their own convenience, Jesus offers, after all of that, an exception. In verse 9 of our passage, Jesus says this, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Adultery ruptures the one flesh design of marriage to the point that one is permitted to cease the hard work of oneness with that person and obtain a divorce. God understands the pain of making that decision because God had to make that decision himself. In Jeremiah chapter 3, God is warning his people in Judah not to go down the adulterous path that his people Israel went down by committing adultery through idolatry and the worship of false gods and prostituting themselves to worship these false gods. God is saying, don't go down that path. It ended in my divorce with Israel. God says this in Jeremiah 3, 8. She, that's Judah, she saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. God understands the pain of unfaithfulness in marriage because he experienced the pain of unfaithfulness in his relationship with Israel. The Apostle Paul touches on this same topic in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 
15. Here he's talking about the release of a believer from a marriage when an unbelieving spouse abandons them. He says this, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Here the topic is abandonment, but Paul's words, in such cases, are frequently used by other writers in Paul's day to mean cases like this. Broadly, I believe that there are four biblical reasons for divorce. I call these the four A's. Abandonment, abuse, addiction, and adultery. As Paul writes, in such cases, in cases like this of abandonment, as Jesus says, adultery, cases like this where the rupture of oneness is so severe, abandonment, abuse, addiction, adultery, divorce is permitted. It's not encouraged. It's not commanded. But I believe we are on solid biblical grounds to say in those four cases, it would be permitted. Outside of this, I want to encourage us. I want to challenge us. I believe God's word commands us to do the hard work of oneness and know your pastor's doors are open if you need to talk about your individual situation. As I sat down with a bit of shame from Cal Ripken uh, telling me I wasn't really paying attention to what he had said, Cal actually sat back in his chair and rubbed his face a little bit. He said, I, I am going to boil it down to one thing. I'll give you one thing that you must have or these eight things won't work out anyway. And he looked at me and said, there are no shortcuts to playing more than 2,600 consecutive games. There's no shortcuts when it comes to perseverance. And I'll say, there are no shortcuts when it comes to marriage. We must all go to the same starting point to understand marriage, the Bible. We can't take the shortcut of the starting point of our feelings or the shortcut of the starting point of our desires or the shortcut of the starting point of what our culture permits. There are no shortcuts to doing the hard work of oneness. If God's design for marriage is oneness, one man, one woman, one flesh for your one life, the only way to get there is to stay in it for life. There are no shortcuts. If God understands the pain of unfaithfulness in marriage, he understands better than any of us that there are no shortcuts when it comes to restoring ruptured oneness. A little later in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, we read this, God speaking to his people, Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband, I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. In Matthew 19, we see Jesus move closer and closer to Jerusalem, another word for Zion. You see, God's people would not return to him. They would not come to him, so God came to them. No shortcuts. All the way to the cross, God came to us to offer us a new covenant, a new opportunity to commit to him, a new opportunity for oneness with him, not on the basis of our faithfulness to him, but through faith in his faithfulness to us. If God did not take shortcuts in his pursuit of oneness with us, then let us trust him anew right now and stop taking shortcuts in our oneness in marriage. This brings us back to the starting point. The starting point for marriage is the Bible, what God has said to us. And so this final closing song will pray, give us faith to trust what you say. Give us faith to trust your starting point for marriage, God, your design for marriage, God, and your understanding of our pain in our marriages, God. Give us faith to trust what you say.
I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I Soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark, cleanse every part of. As we go from this worship service, my prayer is that any hardness of heart that remains would be softened by the clear teaching of Jesus in Matthew 19, that we would know and trust God's starting point for marriage, God's design for marriage, and God's understanding of the pain that comes from unfaithfulness in marriage. If you have pain in your life, around marital issues. We have Stephen ministers that would love to listen to you, to talk to you. You can call the church office, or as I said earlier, our pastor's doors are open. You can also call the church office and set up an appointment to talk with a pastor. If you have a prayer request, put it on our prayer wall on the website because we fix our eyes on Jesus best when we're fixing our eyes on Jesus together. Let's go in peace. Thank you.